So continuing on with the nervous system, we're now going to get into some of the actual structures. So we've last chapter we got through kind of the generalities of the nervous system, divisions, types of tissues, types of cells. Now we're going to get into large scale pieces. So in this one, what we're going to try to cover is we're going to go over the structures that support and protect the brain's spinal cord. We're going to talk about some of the specific regions and landmarks on the brain as well as on the spinal cord. And then we're going to get into functions of different regions of the brain, including the cerebrum, diencephalon, the brainstem, cerebellum, and the limbic system. And then we're going to talk about the cranial nerves, both in terms of where they are located anatomically and also like what they're responsible for. And talk about their central and peripheral connections. And then talk about some of the spinal nerves in the vertebral region and the nerve plexus that each just supplies. So with this video, we're just going to focus on support and protection of the brain. The rest of that stuff we'll get into in later videos. So we're going to go over the meninges in this. We're going to go over blood uh, vessels that supply the brain. We're going to talk about the components of the ventricular system and where we find those. And then production of cerebrospinal fluid and the flow of that through the ventricles. So considering what the central nervous system is for, right? If we think about what the central nervous system is for, it's a, it's a control and communicate, right? It's really, if we can sum up the central nervous system in general, right? Control and communicate of the rest of the body. It's extremely important, right? Those are, that's a huge task for the central nervous system to take on. And it also means that any sort of damage can be very problematic. If you remember from the last video, we did mention that the CNS does not regenerate the same way that the peripheral nervous system does. And so it's extremely important that this central nervous system is protected and that the protections are overlapped. So we have a handful of things that are going to provide protection of different sorts. We're going to look at the bones of the skull and how they enclose and house the brain. We're going to look at the bones of the vertebral column and how they protect the spinal cord. We're going to get into the meninges, which are these membranes um, that are made of connective tissue to help stabilize partition and support the nervous system. And then the blood-brain barrier, this is basically to make sure that things don't cross into the brain that shouldn't. So toxins, pathogens, things like that. It's a very privileged blood supply, meaning not just any, like, blood is not going to just easily pass through into the brain. And then cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF for short, this is going to circulate around. This also kind of washes over it in a way, washes over the brain to remove waste and provide nutrients. And also a little bit of cushion, too. That liquid kind of serves as a cushion. So a lot of different components, but we are going to get into the details of each of these. So let's go for it. So if we look at those protective structures, right, we have like the bone, right? This would be the top of the skull. In this case, we're looking at what looks like part of the frontal bone. So we have skull, we have the periosteum over the skull, um, we have the scalp, that skin is also protective, right? And then underneath we have uh, three different meninges, the dura mater, the uh, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So let's get into those that I just mentioned. So the meninges, right, these are those connective tissue layers that are gonna help provide some protection. We have the three, we have the, the three layers of the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And the way I, if you're trying to remember these in order, the way I remember them is if you're moving from the inside out, it pads the brain, right? P, pia mater, A, arachnoid mater, D, dura mater. It's a little silly, but it might help you remember the order of the meninges. But let's go ahead and start. We're going to start from the outer end and work our way in. So the dura mater, this is going to be just on the inside surface of the cranium and the vertebral ca cavity, so just underneath the bone. And there's two layers to this. We have the periosteal and the meningeal. Um, this is going to form the cranial dura sinuses and septa. So when we look at the cranial side, we have the two layers. But when we look at the spinal side, there's only one. When we look at the space between the bones and the dura mater, we call this the epidural space, right? And so that may sound a little familiar, right? If anyone has ever had to have some sort of surgery or had a baby, right? They may have received what everyone knows of as an epidural, right? So why is it called an epidural? 
because it's injected that 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 pain killing medication is injected into the epidural space probably never put those those together before right because you never really had to think about it so the epidural this means it's just outside or above the dural uh, the dura mater and so this Again, it's just right between the bone and the dura mater. And then when we go underneath the dura mater, we get to the subdural space. We have the epidural and the subdural space. Epidural is going to be more superficial, right? Subdural is going to be deeper. Moving down to the arachnoid mater, this is thin, right? It's thinner than that. Then the dura mater, it has like a, like a loose sac feeling around the uh, central nervous system. And then we get this like really thin mesh-like structure underneath called the arachnoid trabeculae. And so if you think about it, this filamentous space or this uh, mesh, why call it arachnoid? Well, what is an arachnid? A spider. Why do spiders make webs, right? So you can think of it that way, right? That we're making this mesh-like substance, this mesh-like structure called the arachnoid mater, right? This trabeculae are underneath it in what we call the subarachnoid space, and this is going to be filled with that uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And then the pia mater, this is a thin um, fibrous membrane that follows along kind of like this, this superficial uh, edge of the brain and the spinal cord. So if you think about the brain, especially, it's not smooth, right? There's bumps, there's you know dips and hills and valleys right all over that brain. And the pia mater is going to follow along with that. So it's like a tight covering over that, if we think of it that way. So here we can see them kind of together. So here's the dura mater, right? So we see that in this gray, and we see the sinuses, in this case, the super, superior sagittal sinus, right, in this one. So the dura mater has the sinuses in it. Here is that subdural space very small right then we get into the arachnoid mater we see it, it's that it, like this little like yellow orange that thin i mean it's thin right it's thin compared to that dura mater and then the subarachnoid space underneath we see that web right of the arachnoid trabeculae and i think about like a spider web right that's might help you remember the name because arachnoid are spiders like arachnids and then the pia mater, uh, the pia mater down below that in yellow again, and you notice it's like hugging the brain. So even in these little grooves, right, which we'll talk about what those are called in a little bit, but even all these little parts that kind of dip in, you see that pia mater there as well. So when we look at the dura mater, it's going to create these flat partitions called the cranial dura, dural septa, all right? And so this is what's kind of extending into the cranial cavity. And we have the four points. We have the falx cerebri. This is gonna go through the, medli the midline separation of the cere uh, cerebrum. And then the falx cerebelli is gonna separate the ce cerebellum hel um, hemispheres. The tentorium cerebelli is going to separate the cerebellum from the cerebrum. And then the diaphragma cellae is gonna uh, surround the pituitary gland. So this is just kind of like, it's just giving a little bit more protection um, and separation to the different parts of the brain. And so if we look at the next slide, we see those in their space. Right, so each of these kind of gray slope things, these are the, these are the dural septa. And the septum is just to separate, right? Think of like the septum in your nose, right? That separates your two nostrils. So the dural septa, again, are just like extending down, creating the separation. So in this case, we see the falx cerebri that is splitting the two hemispheres, the two sides of the cerebrum, right? As we go back, we see the tentorium cerebelli right here. We see those sinuses that are those bigger openings where we can have some blood flow through. Right, and we don't see the other ones in this particular picture, at least they're not labeled. Now, when it comes to the brain, 
Um, the brain is has to, it, it's an energy hungry organ, right? And that makes sense because it's doing so much, right? It's in control of everything else. And so it's, it's vital that there is a strong blood supply to the brain. So we're going to go ahead and talk about this blood supply to the brain. And it's pretty, I think it's pretty cool. So let's start with arterial and then we'll get into venous. So arterial, we have these branches, these are the internal carotid arteries. So these are arteries that are coming up uh, through your neck. And so we're going to branch from those in the vertebral arteries as well. And this is going to create what's called the circle of Willis. It's this complicated network of arteries. Um, and so if we take a look at what that circle of Willis looks like right here, I'm going to go back and forth between some slides. Right, this is the circle of Willis. We see like it actually is kind of circular. And if you've ever seen a picture of someone with like that's had a clot in one of these, um, there's a really cool one out there on the internet where they remove the clot and it actually still holds the shape of the circle of Willis. It's pretty dang cool. <clears throat> so here's the uh, internal carotids on each side. So coming up, these would be coming up. Again, we're looking at a um, in the, the inferior view from the inferior side, right? coming up through the internal carotids, right? And then we see all these different ones that are branching out. Here's the vertebral ones coming up from the vertebra. And so we have the basilar one here, kind of forming this base of it, I guess you could say. We have the posterior cerebral, the middle cerebral, and the anterior cerebral arteries. And then this is the anterior communicator right here in the middle. And then, oh, I almost forgot the um, ophthalmic which is going to be eye related and then posterior communicating which is linking us so you think anterior posterior communicating you're kind of extending us out now with venous blood supply um, this is where we're taking blood from the brain and we're turning it back and this when we go back to circulation we're gonna have to go through a series of sinuses and those are in that dural layer and so we pointed at least a couple of these out uh, or at least one, um, the superior sagittal sinus. This is going to run into the medial groove of the brain, so that middle groove of the brain, and it's going to drain into the confluence of sinuses along with your occipital sinuses and straight sinus, and then drain them into the transverse sinuses. So again, if we're going from like one sinus to another to another to another. And then finally, we can get to the sigmoid sinuses and then finally to the jugular veins. So we're going from one to the next to the next to the next. So if we're kind of looking at where everything's draining, we have arrows that are going to help you kind of uh, pinpoint how everything's going. But we have, you know, the superior sagittal sinus right here, the inferior sagittal sinus. And if we notice these are all, and here's the transverse sinus. The occipital sinus. We notice that the superior and inferior sagittal sinus, the um, the straight sinus, the occipital sinus, we're all going into the confluence of sinuses because if you think of it like the confluence is like they're all coming together, and then continuing out we go through the transverse sinus, and then go to the jugular vein via the sigmoid sinus. Right, but sigmoid we think is like a curve, so we kind of we kind of see a little bit of it here. So the other thing we have for protection is the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, in the ventricular system. This is made by ependymal cells in the like that are lining that ventricular system. This special membrane made of these cells. We call this our choroid plexus, and that that's going to open up. This is going to line those open spaces called the ventricles. So the ventricles via this choroid plexus, via these ependymal cells, is producing CSF. Um, the lateral ventricles drain the CSF into the interventricular foramina, which is then connected to the third ventricle. The third ventricle opens up to the cerebral aqueduct, and then into the fourth ventricle, which then drains into the subarachnoid space, and then we can reabsorb it into the blood. So we're kind of use like we're kind of just recycling it over and over and over again, right? Those fluids can then enter into the bloodstream. We can then pull them back out when we're creating them with our ependymal cells so on and so forth. So this here in blue, remember this is all hollow, right? These are 
open spaces filled with CSF, right? Um, we will look at the models for this in the lab and you'll notice like it's just kind of like a, like a casting rather than a plasticized model that we've looked at, like that's colorized and everything. Um, it's just like a silver casting and that's because these are hollow spaces. So we have the lateral ventricles here, right there, because there one's kind of like off to the side there. We have the third ventricle right in the middle, and then the fourth ventricle coming down towards the bottom. Right, so those are the ventricles. So lateral ventricles, that'd be one and two. Third ventricle right in the middle. Fourth ventricle midline but lower down. We have what's called the interventricular foramen right here. The cerebral aqueduct. Think about what an aqueduct does, right? Like think about the aqueducts that you might see around town or in agriculture, right? It carries fluids. You can think of it this way too. The cerebral aqueduct is going to be carrying, in this case, CSF, right, from one ventricle to the next. And then down here, we're getting to the central canal and we are uh, where we now done with the ventricles. And so how is this fluid circulating around? Because again, this fluid is constantly washing through, washing over the, um, the central nervous system. So we have the choroid plexus. So if we're starting in here, these are the ones who are making that fluid. We see it kind of comes over inside, this, inside the third ventricle there. We have the interventricular foramen, again, that hole that's gonna join the first, second, and third together. Right, we have flow of that kind of coming around, right, all the way around. We do have some leaving right back into the bloodstream. These what's called an arachnoid granulation. So we can leave here and enter into the bloodstream. And then right here is the cerebral aqueduct taking us down to the fourth ventricle where we can wash over um, the brain stem and the cerebellum, right? And then enter into the central canal. And again, we want to at some point go back into the bloodstream. And we're flooding around. And then once we're in this subarachnoid space, like uh, we're eventually going to get back into that bloodstream.